these are the best tools that we have and when we measure it we get an answer that's somewhat different mm -hmm. um, and the size of this tension or significance of the difference has grown mm -hmm. over 10 years pretty steadily so that we've reached you know more than five sigma and through duplication of measurements other people have done with other techniques uh, what has shown up is a funny dichotomy that how fast the universe is expanding seems to depend on whether you start from the beginning uh, shortly after the Big Bang or whether you start from the present uh, and you know a story shouldn't depend on which end of the story you start in but mm -hmm. that's how it looks to us and so that's why a lot of people are suspecting maybe it's the cosmological model itself the story we tell ourselves to connect the beginning and end. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Welcome, everybody, to a another exciting episode of the Into the Impossible podcast featuring a friend, uh, an inspiration, a local hero, and a global cosmic hero, one of the uh, few people on Earth who proved Einstein wrong and demonstrated that he actually made a blunder by calling his blunder a blunder. We'll get into that. It's my friend Adam Reese professor, Bloomberg professor at the Johns Hopkins University, which I understand is not a plural, but it's a singular name, Jones. And uh, Adam is the Bloomberg professor. He's also known for uh, third place in the Charlie Town Symposium in 2005, which uh, we, we can we can get into some information there. I, there's a person that, that won that, who was supposed to go on to great things in life, including potentially win a Nobel Prize. We won't speak about him. That's me. Uh, we will speak about the person that, uh, that did eventually achieve this, this great, stupendous feat. And uh, that's Adam Reese, of course. So Adam, as you know, when we have guests on the podcast that have written books, we always have a segment called Judging Books by Their Covers. In this case, we uh, we don't have a book by, by you. I'm hoping to be your agent and get residuals. Uh, but we have a paper that's signed by you. And it is called... Well, I'll let you go through it, but we always ask, what is the genesis of the title? How did you come up with it? What was that process like? And usually the authors come and say, my publicist or publisher told me I had to do it this way. Yeah. But in this case, I assume you had some input on it, and uh, and you'll have uh, something to say about it, as well as the cover illustration, which isn't really here. Uh, but we'll talk about, yeah, let's talk about figure one, okay? So Adam Reese, judge the paper by its cover and its title and its, and its artwork, please. Uh, okay, well, you know, we decided to call this one Observational Evidence from Supernovae for an Accelerating Universe and a Cosmological Constant. And uh, this was a case where we decided to say the whole story in the title, in case you never got past the title or even read the abstract. Um, but no, this was, uh, this was our discovery paper. Uh, we had observed distant Type 1A supernovae. Uh, we were using them as uh, tools for measuring distances, also for measuring redshift. Uh, so together, the two measure the expansion rate of the universe. Uh, we had measured nearby ones, which told us the expansion rate today. We were looking at distant ones to tell us the expansion rate in the past. Uh, we were testing the cosmological expectation that the expansion since the Big Bang was slowing down. Uh, and instead, we saw that it was speeding up, that it was accelerating. And so that's why it's the first statement. Uh, and why is that? Uh, to be totally honest, we don't really know for sure. This is generally given the name dark energy, but a specific kind of dark energy, the one with the greatest history and also the one that's the simplest and sort of mathematically is Einstein's cosmological constant. And so in that title, we said we see the universe accelerating it kind of looks like a cosmological constant. And we'll get into some of the details of what a cosmological constant is in, in just a bit. But um, suffice it to say, as I mentioned, that uh, good old Albert here, he had originally put in a cosmological constant because, as we teach our students, he knew that he was made of matter. And anything that has a universe that has matter can either contract or expand, but it can't be static. And back then, I used to make fun of him and say, oh, you know, how could he put this in? It's so stupid. But really... Back in 1915, 1917, the universe was the Milky Way, right? Correct. So what he did was not 
that unexpected, even until 1929 when he recanted, so to speak, right. which was after the night after he won his Nobel Prize himself in 1922. Uh, do you know why he received it in 22? Uh, he, he won the 21 Nobel Prize. And he received it in 22. Really, I remember it, it took him a while to get the message, and it took him a while to get there. Yeah. Um, but I also know there was a lot of controversy mm -hmm. about giving him the Nobel Prize, even though, you know, he should have won five of them. Yeah, exactly, uh, right. But going back to uh, his motivation, uh, I mean, the, the lore is that he had asked astronomers of the day, uh, what's the universe, which, as you said, is the Milky Way, what's it doing? And they said it isn't moving all that much. You know, the velocities of stars was mm -hmm. relatively small. And so he took that to mean the universe was static, more or less, so mm -hmm. that was a kind of observational constraint. Um, you know, the story could have been quite different if, uh, you know, he had asked them, I don't know, 10 years later and uh, learned that actually the the galaxies have red shifts and the things are moving apart. So, you know, he got bad information. And mm -hmm. so he kind of made his theory fit that. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's really hard to get back in the mindset of somebody First of all, in the in the early '90s, before you and your teammate and your competitors, and we'll get into that in some some detail, I hope. Um, and uh, you know that that was it made sense. And actually, even Hubble's early data were were you know horrendously noisy, and he was relying on Henrietta Leavitt's data and and Vesto Slight. I love the name Vesto. I was going to name one of my kids yeah, Vesto, yeah. but you know, yeah, I no, named not, it's not on the top list these days. <laughs> it's Vesto, not. For the first yeah, time. it hasn't made the list in a while. I might get right? teased a bit at school. <laughs> It sounds like Vespa. I don't know. It could be could be kind of a cool thing. Um, but nowadays, you know, we talk about the cosmological constant. We're even trying to measure: is it varying? Is it is it dark energy, or is it a constant? And uh, and we just accept that there's some form of repulsive anti gravitational force causing galaxies to expand. But what was it like as an early graduate student in the '90s, working at Harvard? Bob Kirshner, you know, friend of the show, and and so forth. Uh, Brian Schmidt, past guest on the show. Um, what was it like when when you were you know dealing with this milieu you had this expectation the universe was dominated by matter it's all we knew about there's there, but it, it didn't seem like we lived in an open universe and what was it like to operate in that framework and have the realization that there's something really funny going on in the cosmos right well you know i would like to tell you <clears throat> glorious things about deep thoughts that <laughs> you know we had or that i had at the time but you know to be honest you're doing a measurement an experiment that's hard that people haven't done before and you just want to get the right answer yeah. you know that's all you're just kind of obsessed with getting it right and not screwing it up mm -hmm. and so the reality is when we saw that result my thought was oh we screwed this up, you know, and then you have to go through a lot of checks. And yet, you know, you've also learned to avoid confirmation bias, which means that, you know, you don't want to just uh, assume you made a mistake. And, and the first time you see anything sort of go, yeah, OK, that's got to be a mistake or something. You really need to get it right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we went through a process of checking things. You know, anytime you make a measurement, there are certain aspects of the experiment that you're a little uncomfortable with. You think, oh. That's the first thing I'm going to go take a look at. So, you know, there was this obscure thing astronomers called K-corrections, mm -hmm. which is really just a fancy term for relativistic corrections. Uh, you know, the fact that we're looking at things with larger redshifts. And so redshift has many effects. It, Or I should say expansion has many effects. It causes redshift. It causes time dilation. It changes the energy density of uh, photons that you're looking at. There's, I think, uh, five terms mm -hmm. altogether. And you've got to get them all right. right. So usually it's it's like, oh, did we leave out one of the one plus Z terms or did we stick in one too many? And uh, so, you know, you go back over the whole process when you get an answer that you don't expect. Um, Mm -hmm. And and now we have that similar situation where we we see strange things. Although I would classify your discovery as I argue in my first book as a serendipitous discovery because you were looking for the opposite. Right. So that is sort of self insulating against confirmation bias. Like Penzies and Wilson, we were talking about before we started recording, they weren't looking for the CMB. In fact, you know they were trying to get rid of some noise with the yeah, observations of the first telecommunication satellite. So they they would have preferred probably originally that it wasn't there in the first place. Now we're in the situation where astronomers are and physicists are trying to explain the so-called Hubble tension mm -hmm. and uh, you know I can't resist. I had on, you know, this this famous uh, theory of consciousness m individual named David Chalmers at NYU, who's known for what's called the hard problem of consciousness, uh, which is, you know, can you really identify and define what the conscious qualia experiences of another? I had him on. I was like, look, and he's from Australia. So I said, look, if I had on um, 
uh, you know, someone from Sweden, and uh, and I don't, or if I have an ABBA, and I don't ask them to play, you know, Dancing Queen or something like that, or if I had an ACDC because he's Australian, I said, gotta play Back, back in Black. Black. Come on, yeah. you gotta play it. Uh, so can you please describe? This is like you're like you're you're playing the role of ABBA here, okay. or ACDC, ABBA. All you know, right. four letter acronym. Yeah, start I'll with go a. with ACDC. Okay, cool. Tell me, what is the Hubble tension? And could we be in sort of the opposite domain where, we're looking, where everyone's proposing solutions right. unlike the purity of your discovery right. and your colleagues? Right. Well, so the Hubble tension, let me just back up. The Hubble constant is the rate at which the universe expands today. Mm -hmm. um, and if we understand the universe very well, we should be able to translate the rate at which the universe expands at any time in the universe to any other time. That's sort of, in a way, the idea of physics. You know, you throw a ball in the air, and you know, if you know how fast the ball is traveling at some point, you'll know how fast the ball is traveling at all points. So observations of the cosmic microwave background, which of course you work on, um, give us very detailed picture of the universe shortly after the Big Bang. But you know, that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. You know, some you know, more than 13 billion years ago, uh, told us very specifically what the universe looked like then. Mm -hmm. And so using the physics of the universe, we should be able to translate that information to how fast the universe is expanding today. I would call this a prediction, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a very precise prediction. Uh, and so a powerful, you know, I've been calling it an end-to-end -end test of our understanding of the universe is to measure how fast the universe is expanding using the best tools that we have. Mm -hmm. And so for, you know, the last 15 years, we've been doing that, making more and more precise measurements using the Hubble Space Telescope, using Gaia, European Space Agency mission measuring parallaxes, now using the James Webb Space Telescope. So these are, uh, you know, these are the best tools that we have. And when we measure it, we get an answer that's somewhat different. Mm -hmm. um, and the size of this tension or significance of the difference has grown mm -hmm. over 10 years pretty steadily so that we've reached you know, more than five sigma difference, um, five times the size of the mutual error bars. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's usually the point in time where physicists, scientists are willing to check off being unlucky mm -hmm. as uh, a possible answer. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, I think, have more or less checked that off. Mm -hmm. um, and through duplication of measurements other people have done with other techniques, uh, what has shown up is a funny dichotomy that how fast the universe is expanding seems to depend on whether you start from the beginning uh, shortly after the Big Bang or whether you start from the present. Uh, and, you know, a story shouldn't depend on which end of the story you start in, but mm -hmm. that's how it looks to us. And so that's why a lot of people are suspecting maybe it's the cosmological model itself, the story we tell ourselves to connect the beginning and end. So, of course, the Hubble constant is the current time evaluation of the time derivative of the scale factor divided by you know, the, the scale factor itself evaluated today. I always tell my students, you know, the Hubble you know, the, the Hubble parameter is the second most important uh, number in all of cosmology. If, if you had just one choice, though, I'd say take A of T, take the scale factor from which you can get everything, either kinematically or otherwise. Um, but I can't resist because you're here and and because my students, you know, and I ask them, well, like, the first derivative of the scale factor is the Hubble constant. It's proportional to the Hubble parameter. The second derivative is the Q-naught deceleration parameter, right. which you thought would be decelerating right. back in the 90s. Right. and sanded. It's even named the deceleration. Yeah. <laughs> parameter. The expectation is built right into the name. <laughs> and and, it, and it, maybe it's true because at the very early times it was decent. Yeah, sure. uh, but then uh, the third derivative, I asked my, my students, I was like, I can't remember. And they said, jerk, jerk. I was like, how dare you? How dare you call me a yes. jerk? Um, what could we learn, if anything, from the third derivative? I, you know, I was thinking, you, you can write down the third derivative in Newtonian mechanics of mm -hmm. a particle just moving around and right. maybe it has a rate of change of acceleration. But what physically would it correspond to? Would it lead to another parameter? Could it, could it tell us about a resolution of the Hubble tension? Could it tell us about dark energy in some way? Or what, what could it tell us if we right. could measure? Hey, friends, just a quick request while you're enjoying this video to leave a thumbs up. My thumb's a little bit preoccupied with all Carl Sagan over here, but I hope yours is free enough to leave a like it really helps me with the algorithm and for extra credit homework assignment leave a comment down below what you're enjoying about this video now back to the show i mean is, you know, so in principle it's the transition uh that we see between the universe decelerating and accelerating mm -hmm. um you know it's very surprising that there is a transition that we can witness in our 
you know, recent cosmic history. I mean, mm -hmm. it's very hard to understand because, you know, if it's a cosmological constant, dark energy, the universe will just continue this way for trillions of years. Yeah. So the transition was quite recent. This is often right. called the why now That's problem. Right. Mm -hmm. But going back to the cosmic jerk, um, you know, it, it's possible different conceptualizations of what dark energy could be could give you different values for the jerk. The cosmological constant uh, is tells us that it should be one in mm. kind of dimensionless units. Um, so I think it's another one of these, you know, fundamental tests that you need to do. When mm -hmm. anytime you, you have a theory that you're not, you know, totally confident in, maybe it's phenomenological, if it tells you something you should see, you should go look at that. Right. You know, you should measure it as best as you can. And so, you know, I would just put this on that list of things that, you know, you should check. Uh, there could be a surprise. This is, you know, how we mm -hmm. test theories. Did it ever, you and I were talking over dinner last night about, you know, the different types of scientists, you know, some are more curious, some treat what we do as cosmologists as, you know, work a day, you know, they 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 pack their lunch bucket every day and come to work and uh, and so forth, but others think contemplate the deepest possible topics and and concepts in, in all of in all of science you know I, I pointed out to my students on the first day of cosmology um, if you go to Wikipedia and you type in science the first image that comes up is a picture from the WMAP team of the famous you know evolution of the universe is seen from you know some God's eye perspective if you will so that means that it's sort of paradigmatic um, and a huge swath of the phase space of the universe's history is that afflicted and affected by dark energy um do you ever stop and, and think about it uh i know we're you know we're kind of you're an mit grad you guys are you know very very serious yeah, and, and so, but nerdy. do you ever think what are the implications of this i mean as you said trillions of years of evolution why here why now um does it ever overwhelm you just as a human being? Does it ever like affect you that, wow, I'm in the same kind of category of people that first knew some fundamental truth about the universe? And has it affected you just as a, as a human being, as a parent, right. et cetera? Um, I feel like it, the awe that I get thinking about the universe is very closely connected to the same awe I felt as a kid just looking up into the sky, you know, just looking up at the stars and the blackness and thinking about, you know, how far away things are. And, you know, my parents telling me things that you see are millions of light years away. That means that the light is reaching from millions of years ago. I remember my dad telling me, you know, some of those stars might not even be there anymore <laughs> that you're seeing. Right. And I was just trying to picture, what does that mean? Like there's some beam of light, it's headed to me and it doesn't have a back end to it anymore. <laughs> That's so crazy. And, you know, so I would say the awe that I feel is, the same awe that other people experience who have really looked up at space and have had that feeling. And I'll admit, there are people who don't look up, who are you know, not so fascinated by that. This is, I sort of divide the world into some people are curious and some people are not curious. You can almost divide people up. And the people who are not curious, it's hard to describe to them curiosity. And the people who are curious experience awe like that you know, on a fairly regular basis. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you know, I just, consider myself lucky that I get to combine the work that I do with that curious awe feeling. So a lot of times we kind of devolve on this podcast into, you know, religious or theological topics. We're not going to get too religious or theological, but there's a, and a series of essays written by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who was the chief rabbi of the British Commonwealth until he died, sadly, a couple of years ago, way too early. And he used to talk about um, so-called peak experiences, which is a concept from psychology that when you have, when you see the Grand Canyon, when you see a sunset, when you see this, or yeah, that, yeah. Um, people have awe and they want to have uh, some source of gratitude to displace that feeling of awe towards or project towards a source of gratitude. Obviously for a rabbi, he's talking about God and some almighty power. It could be nature. It could be whatever uh, you like. But humans love to have some sort of prima facie mover that, that causes them to experience the feeling of gratitude. I believe that as scientists, we become inured to such feelings because we witness it every day when you start thinking about well if like one of these parameters was changed by a tiny right. little bit we wouldn't be here wondering why does it have right. the value that it has i wonder you know is there any way that you can cultivate you know you have children i have children can we cultivate the maintenance not just the incipient the original curiosity all kids have right, right. but how do you sustain it because 
you're right. Like some of my colleagues in this very building, I won't say who, you know, I'll say like, I'll have them over for dinner or whatever. I'll look at a constellation and I'll say, oh, what do you, what do you make of that constellation? Or, I don't know what that is. Right. And I always joke like, oh yeah, if, if you study geography, I wouldn't ask, expect you to know where Mexico is. You know, it's just like, it's just your freaking job. You're an astro namer. Yeah. Right. But, but tell me, is there a way to, to, you know, to inculcate, but also to maintain, sustain, or is it really innate in the human being, you know, individually? I mean, I think, you know, anytime you spend a lot of time looking at one thing, even if it was something that gave you awe, you know, even if you're the, you know, tour guide of the Grand Canyon, you know, at some point, <laughs> you know, you, you get used to it a little <laughs> bit so that you're not like each day like, oh my God, look at that. Right? That's true. I have to, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, every, um, uh, every so often I take one of my kids, you know, I pretend I'm a good dad. I, I take him on a field trip and there was a field trip about three or four years ago before COVID. COVID at SeaWorld here in lovely San Diego. Come and visit lovely downtown San Diego. You'll get a commission. You get a free signed copy of that. I'm sorry. And I got there 15 minutes early. I'm a good dad and I was a chaperone. And uh, there's a huge roller coaster there. I forget the name of it. Stuart, I don't know if you know the name of it, but let me know what, what it's called. The Lightning or whatever. So there's some huge roller coaster. And there's a guy whose job it is to go on the roller coaster by himself every morning and make sure he he's not going to die. And I and I always bring my telescopes and binoculars wherever I go, as I'm sure you do. And I like zoomed in on him and the guy was like a stoic. <laughs> he was like almost like angry. Like he, was, he was like totally <laughs> oblivious yeah. to it. So you're right. Yeah. yeah, the, yeah. The, the tour guide of the Grand Canyon is a great right. analogy. And you know, I, I would say in, in my example in particular, um, you know, I've been looking at images from the Hubble Space Telescope for about 20 years. <laughs> yeah, right. And I, I know conceptually, intellectually, that they are fantastic, but I am so used to what they should look like that occasionally I'll get one and I'll be like, they're a little that one's a little out of focus, I think. That one's not, it's not so sharp. And so I got to experience all, all over again mm -hmm. uh, this past year when we launched the James Webb Space Telescope, right. and I'm now looking at the same things that I've studied, stared at, whatever, with Hubble, mm -hmm. and along comes James Webb, and awe comes right back to me uh, in that experience. I'm, I'm now looking at images from James Webb Space Telescope, and I have double awe in that, you know, I was really skeptical that this thing was going to work. <laughs> and so it's like, you mean that thing actually worked? And you mean this is, I can actually see like this? And so it's just spectacular. Oh, wow. So getting those experiences, all it requires is a new $10 billion telescope yeah. every or 20 years. a bigger years. Grand Canyon. <laughs> and we'll all be right back. <laughs> I've heard that the Mariner Trench on Mars is, okay. is quite nice. Right. So let's talk about your web paper. I, I read it uh, earlier today, and I'm, you know, I can really say because I'm a cosmologist. So what the hell do I know about Cepheid variables? But I was really interested to read this paper. I mean, first of all, you're an excellent writer. You know that. That's why I want to be and get the royalties and residuals from your upcoming books in perpetuity. Um, uh, stay tuned for that announcement next time Adam is in town. Just to be clear, my papers are free. The 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 telescopes are. <laughs> taxpayers work and we i don't <laughs> that's right this work. is free but the signed one yeah. well, that'll cost you okay. um and and i should mention also that you're here for to deliver the dashin lecture which is a prize lecture that we offer to the most renowned um you know physicists and cosmologists around the world and astronomers and and you follow in a grand tradition barry barish came a few years back and and we've had uh, andrea gez and many other you know luminaries both uh, astronomical and otherwise but I read this paper and uh, with one of your students from just this year, initial observations, Cepheid variables. And what was interesting and fascinating to me is you were basically using it, if I'm not wrong, to compare measurements made from a supernova that's like your father's light from a star that may not appear. It was from a supernova that popped off in, in, in uh, the year 2012. Right. Um, talk about that. What kind of sure. supernova is it? What, yeah. what is so, that? And how do you use so, something that it's gone now? How yeah. could Webb observe something that's not Right, here? right, right. So, you know... Uh, going back to the Greeks, the yeah. Greeks uh, first taught us about triangles, which are very useful, uh, and they taught us uh, how to measure parallax, yeah. which is you know something we do naturally with our eyes, which is to build a triangle in space, a virtual triangle, um, and if you can uh, get to get a view from two different spots on the triangle, right, you can measure the angle through which a distant object moves and that completes the triangle. That angle is the, you know, enclosed angle. If you can measure what we call the baseline, the separation between your two points of view, then, you know, basic trigonometry tells you the length of that triangle, tells you the distance. And so in an ideal world, we would go out and we would look at everything with using parallax. And in our case, parallax we obtained by uh, waiting six months for the Earth to move from one side of its orbit to the other. That makes our triangle. The problem is, unfortunately, that things are really far away in 
the universe. They're really shockingly far away. Mm-hmm. In fact, if I could just say, this is one of the main reasons in the beginning that the Greeks disputed the idea that the Earth moved around the sun was mm-hmm. because they reasoned uh, if that were the case, then as they looked out at distant things like stars, you know, what we see as constellations would change their shape over the course of the year right. because, you know, we would move and, you know, and so they couldn't see any uh, what we would call parallax. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they said, therefore, the Earth is not moving. And so what they just couldn't imagine was just how far away things are. Mm-hmm. There was parallax. It was just too small to see. Mm-hmm. Um, and so over the years, we've gotten much better at measuring parallax, primarily with space missions. But even with the greatest space mission, which right now is Gaia, European Space Agency mission, we cannot measure parallax outside the Milky Way. Okay, Mm -hmm. So if we want to measure distances even longer range, we have to measure the parallaxes of certain kinds of stars in the Milky Way whose uh, whose characteristics allow us to recognize them in other galaxies. So that mm-hmm. when we see one, we could say, oh, that's just like this star nearby that I measured the parallax for. It's just far away. Its brightness will tell me how far away it is. And so there's a certain class of star called a Cepheid variable uh, that has been our gold standard of measuring distances to galaxies since Henrietta Swan Levitt first recognized them in the small Magellanic Cloud more than 100 years ago. So this is, you know, we don't get the invention of new kinds of stars all the time. So we sort of, you know, in many cases, we use what was known just with better technology. And so the wonderful thing about these Cepheid variables is, first of all, they're super giant stars, not just regular stars. They are among the most luminous stars that exist. And so that means that not only do you have a standard candle, but your standard candle is a lighthouse. It's really powerful. So we can measure really long range distances. And the other thing that makes them very handy is they vary in their brightness. Now that might sound annoying, like, Mm -hmm. oh, you told me you want a standard candle, you want a variable candle? Well, no, their mean, the average brightness they have is the standard candle. But the fact that they vary and the period that their variation occurs over scales with the mass or luminosity of the star so that by measuring the period, we can actually tell just how luminous that standard candle is. So it it customizes or standardizes the measurement. And so we find with Cepheid variables, we can measure distances with one star that are good to just like 3%. And so now what we do is we use the Hubble Space Telescope to measure the distance to galaxies with Cepheid variables, but we pick special galaxies. We pick ones that recently hosted a type 1a supernova. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because Cepheid variables will only carry you so far, uh, tens of megaparsecs. Mm -hmm. Type 1a supernovae, which are Chandrasekhar mass white dwarfs, uh, are much more luminous than Cepheid variables. They reach five billion solar luminosities. And so with powerful telescopes, we can see them all the way out to redshift two, maybe even beyond. And so this forms what we call the cosmic distance ladder, the ability to measure the parallax to a kind of a star to measure its luminosity, see that star in a galaxy that hosted a type 1a supernova to calibrate it, and then see type 1a supernovae about as far as you need to. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so we use this to gauge the expansion rate of the universe and how well do we have to know i'm you know t- taught this obviously uh, you know only a fraction as well as you could uh, uh convey but you know it occurred to me that well the cepheids are they have, you know it's a nuclear power plant in space and we we know very little about our own sun and you know, how much could individual intrinsic variations which for the cognizante systematic variations uh in a cepheid versus systematic variations in in white dwarf stars or in these type 1a supernovae where you know is there any dependence on the on the companion to the white dwarf so first of all white dwarf is this weird material called degenerate matter which when you add more to it it gets smaller (laughs) which is kind of strange right it's nuclear matter um it is the end point of what our sun will get to i always forget it uh it won't reach the chandrasekhar mass no not the chandrasekhar but will it be a white dwarf it will be a white dwarf which is basically a carbon it's a pure uh, diamond basically right right? right. (laughs) but it's not undergoing thermonuclear fusion anymore so it's just like a, a junk chunk of of um, of uh, of this material. So, is it possible that you know we could explain some of the Hubble tension for nuclear physics side? Like, assume you're perfect, right. everything you sure. do is perfect, but. Could we not understand either the Cepheid, uh, you know, intrinsic properties of the nuclear reactions going on in Cepheid or in the companion to a white dwarf? Are there uh, re- opportunities right. to explain the Hubble tension? Right. So um, 
observational cosmology, sort of the way at least I practice it, uh, is based on empirical calibration of these tools. So we start out with theory and we say, oh, type 1A supernova, Chandrasekhar mass explosion. Okay, that should be a pretty good standard candle. Let me start there. Or Cepheid variable. Okay, we understand uh, pulsations. We understand the, the opacity mechanism that drives this. We understand that this ought to be a good standard candle. Let me start there. And then we develop what we call training sets, which are basically large samples where we know the answer, where we know what they should look like. So for example, for Cepheid variables, you might look at a galaxy that has many hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. And now you know they're effectively all at the same distance from us. So now you look for empirical characteristics that might change or correlate with their indicating that that galaxy is a little too far, a little too close. Mm -hmm. And so you train your, your measurements to sort of account for those. Mm -hmm. And so we've done that with type 1A supernovae. That was something um, I worked on in my thesis. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out the light curve shape of the type 1A supernova tells you whether it's a little more luminous or less luminous. Mm -hmm. uh, the color tells you uh, whether it's been uh, affected by dust or not. Mm -hmm. You correct for that. The same thing with Cepheid variables. We look at many of them in a galaxy and we correlate uh, the metallicity, uh, the chemical abundance of the Cepheid variable with its luminosity. We calibrate that out. We we uh, make our measurements in the near infrared to avoid the effects of dust. So there's no uh, step of sort of theoretical input where we would say, oh, uh, if uh, some process in the star convection or conduction is occurring differently than we thought, uh, that isn't actually what we do. We do this empirically, but most importantly, it's purely differentially. So we're always comparing, as I said, we're starting out with parallax. That's where the distance knowledge comes in. That's the Stable, geometry. base, Correct. pure. And then everything after that is ensuring that the object that you're measuring at one location where you measure parallax is the same as the object you're measuring far away. Mm -hmm. And so you measure everything you can about it. If you can explain all of the dispersion, the, the, the scatter, as understandable experimental errors, and if there's nothing left over, mm -hmm. then you have a lot of confidence there as well. And so that's you know that's more or less the process. And at some point, at the end of the day, we have to rely on something we call the cosmological principle, which more or less says that we are not in a special place in the universe. There are no special places. And so uh, once I've made measurements of these properties, there's no reason a supernova or a Cepheid variable should be different than another one just because it's in a different place in space, mm -hmm. right? Because if we couldn't assume that, we'd have to sort of give up on doing all experiments. Yeah. So instead we say, we'll assume that, and then if everything is crazy and nothing makes sense, we may revisit that. Right. But um, you know, it's worked pretty well so far. So in this paper from the AppJ 2023 with your student, you talk about this effect that you, you call like biasing bright. What, what does that refer to? Uh, what, right. Right. Is the Hubble yeah. is the Hubble bias dim compared to the web? Right. First of all, the, you're using a, a specific package of instrumentation right. on the web that's different from the Hubble. Correct. In a far different wavelength regime. Yes. So what does it mean that it's biased? Right. Should we trust you at all? Right. <laughs> right. right. You have these biases. So, so um, you know, in 1998, when we saw that the universe was accelerating, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a chain of measurements, but the new measurement, the thing that you know hadn't been done before, was looking at distant supernovae, and they were fainter than you would have expected if the universe wasn't accelerating. So in those days, we thought, is there a reason supernovae could be fainter? You know, you think in the direction of what seems surprising. In the present case, we look at the Hubble tension, and one way to look at it is to say, oh, the the Cepheids uh, look brighter in galaxies that host type 1a supernovae than I would have expected if there wasn't this Hubble tension. Uh -huh. So is there a, a way I can understand that they are brighter than they really are, that they just look brighter, okay? Mm -hmm. And so we look for that with the James Webb Space Telescope because James Webb has such better resolution that you know maybe it could have shown us if there was something else kind of snuggled up to the Cepheid variable that was adding light and biasing it bright. And so with the great resolution, of the James Webb Space Telescope, and I'm gonna talk more about this in my talk today, mm -hmm. we have reached the limit where we can really see down to the background where there's nothing else around. Mm. And so far, the Cepheid variables don't look any different than they look like with the Hubble Space Telescope. Mm. Uh, now we're using a much more powerful telescope, much greater sensitivity, and you know, this 
to some people this might seem boring like oh wow you do a measurement and then you go out in another telescope and you just do it again and it's like yeah that's what we do because they have very different uh, systematics you know, yeah they have mm -hmm. very different systematics it's hard to tell a story that the uh, uh, you know, the effect wouldn't uh, go away if you looked at with a telescope with a better resolution or greater sensitivity or a different wavelength or things like that. So, you know, the, the real test of uh, experimental result is, you know, it doesn't matter who's looking at it with which telescope or what. It's it's a fundamental truth. It's it's on the sky. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so far, you know, the, the Hubble tension seems to be passing that test. Um, so it's a that's persisting, which is which is you know on one hand it's it's disappointing because you don't have a resolution, but on the other hand it's really inspiring because maybe you'll be the person out there watching this that can add to the, our knowledge and maybe resolve it or maybe discover maybe there's something we don't understand intrinsically about gravity, about right. space time, about Lorentz invariance, all sorts of things. And, right? and it's important I think to point out to people, you know, when cosmologists say, oh, we have a model of the universe, oh, we understand the universe, you know, you have to understand that our what we call model really is a description of the universe rather than maybe a deep physical understanding of and so you know we have dark energy we don't understand the nature of that yet uh, we have dark matter you know it's we think it's a particle we don't know the properties of the particle we don't know if it has collisions if it decays uh, if it's stable uh, if it interacts and so we take some very vanilla guesses about that and so when we see tensions really all we're saying is we see some measurement that doesn't match the most vanilla guess mm. for our understanding of the universe. Mm -hmm. And so that might simply mean that there's a wrinkle to our understanding of the universe, that something is not totally vanilla, it's pistachio or something, you know? <laughs> and so, Neapolitan. you know, it's, it's, you know, sometimes I think people get the idea like, <laughs> We're upset or disturbed. Everything should fit, and we gotta, you know, get a hammer and nail down this nail and and get everything to stick. And I would say just the opposite. I would say, you know, tensions are our opportunities. You know, the story of science always is you have a paradigm, you have a model. You know, uh, most models are useful, but they're not correct. Mm -hmm. And so you use the model as a tool to make predictions, and then eventually, when your measurements get good enough, you break the model uh, because it's not good enough for that measurement, and then you learn something. So right. you know. At, at worst, I would say we're going through that standard process that is usually very enlightening. Yeah, it's like when they turn on the you know the Large Hadron Collider, they they first calibrate and they discover all the right. previous seventy Nobel prizes. Um, <clears throat> Speaking of Nobel Prize, you were kind enough to, to loan me your Nobel Prize. Oh. Uh, thank you so much for wow. doing that. Okay. Um, that we're bringing don't, uh, yeah. don't eat that. that don't eat that. Yeah, <laughs> um, I remember the day that you won it because I was giving a colloquium on the East Coast at my alma mater at Brown University. Um, and uh, and I remember reading in the newspaper a comment from your uh, mater, your thesis advisor, uh, Bob Kirshner. And I remember he was asked, um, what's the strongest force in the universe? Uh, it's not gravity, it's jealousy. I, I asked Brian Schmidt this. What did he mean? What, was he talking about this? What, what, what do you think? Rob, I, I've never asked him. I should ask Bob, but, you know, I haven't. Uh, he's, he's been busy with his uh, telescope projects and with the Gordon Moore Foundation. Uh, what do you think he meant by that statement? Well... So I remember when he said that, and uh, and to be very clear, um, actually said it when we were still doing that work. It wasn't at the time of the oh, Nobel really? Prize. Okay. It was actually at the time when there were two teams that were competing uh -huh. uh, to make these measurements. It was in a New York Times article. Yes. Uh, okay. And in the late 1990s, and and you know what he meant in some ways is there's a history in not just science but in all areas of life. I think for. Uh, there to be competition. Competition can sometimes drive excellence. Mm -hmm. um, it can also drive, I think you've written about in your book, it can drive people to maybe even make mistakes. Yeah. Um, but uh, whichever it drives, I guess you can't ignore the fact that it is a powerful force in people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it does animate and it could be used, you know, in Judaism, we have this concept of the Yetzer Hara, the Yetzer Hartov, you know, the thing that makes you do good, your good inclination, your bad. In uh, Buddhist tradition, there's the yang and the yang, and they have different elements of each one in a synergistic fashion. You mentioned the cosmological principle, and I can't resist because, you know, how often do we get together in person? It's been four years since we just were in person, let alone we do a podcast together. 
Um, but uh, but there, there have been claims that maybe the cosmological principle needs a revision. Maybe it's wrong. There's a five sigma tension, according to Subir Sarkar, who I mentioned in my book. He, he wasn't super happy with uh, the way I referred to him, but there's no offense. Subir, I hope you're watching. I hope you'll come on the podcast at some point. Uh, but he has claimed, among other things, not only is the cosmological you know uh, principle needing uh, in need of revision or perhaps wrong, but that dark energy is certainly not the way the consensus has has put it that there is uh, the, the, we don't understand dark energy is, is uh, I think the claims that he's made uh, and he's also made claims about you know inflation and other things so you know he has uh, but he's an eminent scientist he's a uh, head of the theoretical physics division I think at, at Oxford what do you make of these claims not him specifically obviously but what claims do you make about of, the cosmological principle yeah but the cosmological principle might yeah. need revision based on the asymmetry of different radio sources versus the CMB right. dipole and so forth. I mean I could I could tell you the the evidence or the data where people have claimed that there's anisotropy uh, of objects in space, um, mm -hmm. I found not convincing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm particularly familiar with supernovae, and so I don't think there is any good evidence, at least not strong evidence, that uh, space is anisotropic. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's important in that I don't see the evidence for any violation of the cosmological cosmological principle you know having said that i mean it's something you always have to keep in the back of your mind uh because you know it's not a principle handed you know in, in you know to us on a silver plate that says first start with this mm -hmm. but you know when you think about what it means to uh get rid of the cosmological principle it's you almost have to go back to the beginning of like can we do experiments can we look out in space and infer things you know when uh, when ancients first looked up at the stars right they had to figure out uh, are those just holes in the firmament uh, mm -hmm. through the which light passes, or are they real physical objects, right? And so they did experiments. They looked at uh, stars, and over time they noticed, gee, they collect together. Uh, that's what would happen if there was gravity, and then they observed some, hey, they're moving around each other. Okay, holes in the firmament wouldn't do that. However, some clever person could come along and say, yes, but very creative uh, god or somebody who wants to mess with us. And, Delicious. You know, yeah. And so at some point, you decide, you know, I'm going to go with the physical explanation of what I see out there. Mm -hmm. um, and the cosmological principle is a lot like that, too. I'm going to assume that there's not a special place in space uh, that everywhere is the same and I can do experiments now I can learn things in one location and I can apply them in a different location mm -hmm. and you know that's such a logical and rational way to proceed so powerful that you know it's the last thing I would give up I like I would be right up there with like oh we can't do math by the way <laughs> as we as we try to explore science you know right uh, we don't know if math applies out there either although to, to be fair you know there is something that you can have too much of a good thing and there was a proposal by Bondi and Gold and, and others, including the former occupant of this office, Jeffrey Burbage, the quasi-steady state cosmology that Jeff used to champion. Um, I had on Jayant Narlikar, who is Hoyle's you know, best student. Uh, he's still uh, doing well and living in uh, in India, and we had a great podcast. Um, but Does he still believe steady state? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh okay. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, and part of that is just, you know, he thinks you can't have too much of a good thing. So he not only adds in very and Lorentz boost and so forth, but time invariance and that the universe should be the perfect cosmological principle that they invoked was that the universe was time translation invariant, therefore mm -hmm. it didn't have a singular origin, a singular event. Um, so so you're right, though. I think, yeah, that would be, and that's why I, I've gotten interested in these Lorentz invariance violation tests and things mm -hmm. we hope to do with the, with the Simons Observatory and maybe even optical telescopes on Earth looking for, you know, variation in time of flight of different objects. Um, and so uh, I want to turn to a, an article you were quoted in just yesterday. I read it with uh, in Physics World, maybe. Uh, and it was about measuring the Hubble constant using gravitational time delays and gravitational lensing. Can you talk about lensing? Another thing that Einstein predicted, he had to recant it. I mean, he was wrong. He said they would never be discovered, like gravitational waves, Barry Barish's uh, forte. What would he say about gravitational <laughs> waves? Wow. Yeah. He didn't think we could yeah. detect them. Yeah. I remember the, my favorite story about, about lensing before uh, I stop interrupting you. It was that he, um, back in the day, if you were Einstein, you could write to nature, and the article starts off with, a few, a little while ago, a Mr. Mandel came to me asking if I could do a little
exponential calculation. <laughs> and this is published, and at the right. end, he's like, nah, I'll never see gravitational lensing. So what is lensing? How sure. can I tell you about the Hubble constant? Sure. What the heck sure. does that have to do with it? So uh, when we look at objects far away, we are looking through a lot of space, and there's often matter in that space. And as Einstein showed, a matter bends light. And so uh, uh, balls of matter, large groupings of matter, can act not just bending light, but since they're compact and, and, and uh, in one spot, they can actually act like a lens, very analogous to a lens. And so uh, what that means is, like a lens, you have uh, rays of light that leave a distant object, and of course the one that's headed directly at you may go to you, but there are ones that were diverging. They are gonna uh, go away, and you will never see those. They're headed off to other observers. Like this Except, bottle of vodka. Exactly, right. it's bottle of vodka. It and, uh, so, you know, the heavy objects bend those rays of light that were headed in different directions back to the line of sight of the observer. Yes. And so you may see multiple images from those different rays of light that were headed other ways. You might see as if, it, if you have perfect perfect symmetry of the system where you have, you know, that that ball of matter that's acting like a lens is directly between you and the distant object, you can get a lot of rays of light that turn into an actual ring. Uh, it's called an Einstein ring. And so these are fascinating objects to study gravity. They're beautiful objects. Um, and uh, because those different paths of light that head to us have different lengths in space, uh, it takes light different times to travel from the object to us. And so if the the background source that you're looking at actually varies in some way. If some event occurs, a supernova or a quasar uh, gulps some matter and changes its brightness, then you may see that event occur in the different images at different times. And so if you have uh, different path lengths and you understand the speed of light and you measure the time differential between them, it gives you information about distances. And anytime you say distances, you know, you have the potential to measure the expansion rate of the universe because mm -hmm. you're measuring, you know, you know, redshift and you know distance. So that's the great thing about these these lens systems is they're great laboratories for uh, gravity. Mm -hmm. The the tricky business is you have to have an understanding of exactly what kind of matter, uh, sorry, how it's distributed along the line of sight. Um, and, you know, we don't have perfect ideas right now of how matter is distributed. There's dark matter, of course. Dark matter is in halos. Those halos have a shape. And, uh, you know, we argue a little bit about what that shape is. So there's a fair bit of what we call model uncertainty in mm -hmm. trying to go from observations of lensed objects with time delays to a value of the Hubble constant. Mm -hmm. So I would say these are very early days in playing that game. And so there was a paper reported uh, a week ago uh, of uh, the first multiply imaged supernova uh, called Refstall, where you can measure uh, the different images of the supernova and you can try to infer distances. Um, and I think it's very exciting and interesting work. Um, but you know, looking at it, the hardest part by far is the modeling. And so, uh, as I recall, they had eight or 10 different models attempt to model this. Mm -hmm. If I can use an analogy, I think it's a little bit like hurricane modeling. Have you ever seen, you know, people try to predict where a hurricane's gonna make landfall. Yeah. Um, and so, you yeah. know, you're going, all right, well, let me feed in the wind speed at San Juan and how fast it was going when it passed Cuba. And then you see these spaghetti models that predict right. all these different places. So I would say at this moment in time, the uncertainty is dominated by the range of models mm -hmm. and what they predict. And so I think, you know, the the lesson here is that this is a capability that is being developed and, you know, with more objects like this, we will probably learn better how to how to model these systems just the same way that, you know, you like a nice large data set of hurricanes and actually to know where they made landfall to to teach your models. Mm -hmm. So I think that process is ongoing. Wow, oh, that's excellent. Um, so you at uh, Johns Hopkins, and now we're going to have a little um, comic relief, maybe, uh, from all the nerding out we've done. Uh, so you are the Bloomberg Professor of Physics uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, um, what does the former mayor of New York uh, have to... <laughs> why does he have an interest in cosmology and supernovae? Uh, what could he possibly have? Well, first of all, what's he like? He's one of the richest human beings who've ever walked the planet. Yeah. What is he like as a person? As a, um, as a, and can you get him on the show? I, right. No, just kidding. I, so I've been fortunate to meet him a couple of times, and 
Uh, I could tell you I was really surprised. I thought, you know, this would be somebody to, you know, mostly focused on, you know, business and philanthropy. And uh, all he wanted to talk to me about was physics. Um, you know, he was intensely curious. He was well read. He wanted to talk about quantum entanglement. He was interested in cosmology. He wanted to look through our telescope. You know, this is what he was interested in. And uh, so, you know, I was extremely impressed because my you know, well of knowledge is not, I think, nearly as vast as his is. Um, but, you know, he's quite passionate about many, many different subjects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it also uh, related to this is, you know, he went to Johns Hopkins University. Right. And so, you know, he's grateful for the education he received there, as, you know, many people are grateful for the educations they received in many universities. And so uh, yeah. he's we, given back uh, quite a lot. We talked over dinner last night about future of education and, you know, whether, whether we'll be replaced by, you know, super artificial intelligence. Are you nervous? Are you, are you concerned about your job yeah. security? I, uh, I would. Yeah, that that would be all right with me. OK, <laughs> <laughs> I'll go about as far as I can go. And then uh, a I can take over. No, I mean, look, I, I think, you know, the most optimistic take I could say on this is hopefully, um, you know, AI will uh, do things for us uh, that will leave our minds free to do, you know, more challenging things, more interesting things, things we're more curious about or, mm -hmm. or are more compelling in some way. And so, you know, I've already started using ChatGBT, you know, oh, mm -hmm. write me a little code for this or, yeah. you know, write me a draft letter of that or something like that. And so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tool. I mean, uh, you know, people I know are quite worried that can be used in negative oh, ways. Yeah. And, I, and I know that that is the case. I think, you know, it's hard to think of an advancement in technology that didn't have this sort of, you know, double-edged sword to it. Like, you know, this could be used in wonderful ways. And, you know, this can be used in terrible ways. Right. And, uh, you know, ever since we invented the wheel, you know, that, right. that has been impossible. And astronomers, as past guest Neil deGrasse Tyson has pointed out, you know, they're always intimately connected to war as accessory to war. As, uh, yeah. as, uh, Anything people want to do, they will use the new technology for <laughs> Uh, so we'll we'll uh, wrap up pretty shortly because you have to get ready for your talk and I this uh, can't, was the can't, well, wait yeah no I don't want to like burn out your vocal cords but you've got such a mellifluous voice uh, I'm not too worried about that um, the last question I ask about is this controversy which you because you're so intelligent you avoid social media like the plague but <laughs> on social media this summer there was a huge yeah brouhaha the Big Bang never happened proven by the James Webb Space Telescope but this also cost a little bit less than ten billion dollars by the way for my undergraduates to make that 3D printer. Um, tell me, this this concept yeah. that the Big right. Bang never happened because we see objects at great greater redshifts. Redshift, the record now is 12 or something like that. Or 13. 13. It's insane. And change. So, so how is that compatible? How could you possibly have a Big Bang unless right. the Big Bang never right. happened and the universe right. is... Oh, yeah. Right. So the issue really is, as we look further back with the James Webb Space Telescope, we look to when the universe was very young, when objects were first forming, and we have expectations of what those objects should look like. They should look like younger versions of what we see today. We have models and understanding of how they grew to the size they did, how they developed. And so it would be like, you know, like saying, hey, I've never seen your baby pictures, but let's take a look at them. And I expect you're, you're smaller and you're cuter and stuff like that. Yeah. And, uh, You'd be wrong <laughs> no, in my I, case. I, I but but, but anyway, <laughs> but, you know, you have expectations. So, you know, if I saw a picture of you, you're two years old and you have a full beard, right, I'd go, whoa, this doesn't make sense or something. Maybe you weren't born when I thought you were or something Benjamin like that. Button effect right. is going so, on, Brian. So, you know, that's a kind of an overstatement of the fact that, you know, when we've looked out at distant galaxies, some of the earliest ones, astronomers have been surprised. They have looked more massive. They have looked further developed uh, than we thought. And so some initial reactions were, oh, something's wrong with our understanding of the Big Bang. And, and what we really mean is the time interval that the Big Bang allows from beginning to those galaxies, only a couple hundred million years, some astronomers are saying that doesn't seem like enough time for those to form. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple things you have to think about to take a pause with that. Uh, first is, this is hard. Yeah. And so in particular, we recognize that whenever we look out uh, at things, we see the rarest of objects. We see the brightest, we see the biggest. And so we have to take into account something we call selection effects. You know, you look out at a crowd and you see the tallest people. If you think everybody is that tall, you know, you're gonna get confused. So um, we have to do that science carefully. And also uh, we've only looked at an 
at a little bit of sky with the James Webb Space Telescope, we haven't yet done the big, wide, deep fields, and we're going to get much better information. So I think it's fair to say the initial look is surprising. Things do look more massive and developed. Whether that is enough to break our understanding or tweak our understanding, whether it teaches us about some processes that occurred faster than we expected, or whether it actually teaches us something even about gravity is occurring differently. You know, I like to kind of take an open mind with it. Let's collect the data. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody is jumping to the conclusion that the Big Bang didn't happen, then they probably already had that as their agenda to to say that at the first moment of something. But, you know, this is a beautiful process, this Mm -hmm. discovery process, but it takes time. You can't just take a picture and immediately know what it means. So, you know, I would tell people, you know, check back on this story in six months, in a year, in two years. We'll know more. Great. So that brings us beautifully to the final question in the same article where you mentioned our friend uh, of uh, astrophysics, Roger Blanford. He says um, that he's optimistic that someday this will wrap up uh, one way or another. And he said, it's a knowable thing. That's a resolution to the Hubble tension. The universe is cooperative in this sense. I was kind of struck. I felt that was a little bit, um, I don't know what the right way, yeah, yeah. Pollyanna or, or, or what, what you'd say. But but I'm curious what, you, what Adam, what you would say. Because I don't think nature's under any obligation right. to, to cooperate with us whatsoever. Right. So what what do you right. think? What the, first of all, are you optimistic as Rogers? Yeah. yeah. So so I would I would answer this from a, both an empirical and a theoretical standpoint. So from an empirical standpoint, do I believe that we ought to be able to measure how fast the universe is expanding today? That we ought to be able to predict how fast it's expanding from the cosmic wave background, and we should expect those two to meet. Yeah, I think that from an empirical standpoint, there's nothing in that measurement process where I say. Well, that's impossible right. or nobody can do that. Now, you know, could we make the measurements better? Absolutely. Will the new facilities teach us things? James Webb, LIGO, uh, future Gaia data releases, uh, uh, CMB uh, experiments that are going to be extended like S4, Simon's Observatory. These will weigh in on this and teach us new things. But this is a doable problem. That doesn't worry me. Um, the theoretical implications, what's actually going on um, may be beyond us, it may not be beyond us. It's hard to predict. You know, when uh, astronomers noticed that the orbit of Mercury was processing, right? They could measure that thing all day long. They could say, could there be another planet out there, Vulcan, that's causing this? We'll look for that. And, you know, ultimately they didn't find it, right? But I'm still holding out hope. Who can, who can, you know, who could say, well, maybe somebody will come along and develop a new theory of gravity, general relativity, and it will explain this, Mm -hmm. right? You couldn't sit down and say that'll happen in one year, 10 years, (laughs) 100 years, 10,000 years or never. And so that's the part that I'm, you know, not sure if there's something deep and fundamental going on and it takes a deep insight and what time scale we will have. I just, it's very difficult to predict. Well, speaking of deep things, Adam, your deep intellect has been an inspiration to me for as long as I've known you, uh, continues to be. We I learn so much every time I'm with you. Uh, I wish you could be out here permanently. We'll talk about that later. Uh, you know, maybe we'll slip a, another one of these uh, delicious. Pretty big. <laughs> you like that, yeah? Uh, yeah we have uh, we treat our visitors here nicely. Um, Adam Reese, thank you so much for visiting. Thank Fourth you. time on the podcast. I hope for many, many more. All right, thanks. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. 